Methodist Church began with a combination of words. The words first those written to be sung by Charles Wesley, and then those written to be preached by John Wesley. And those words in combination have been changing people's lives for a long time. We uh, hear one of those sets of words more often than the others. Uh, Charles Wesley, his hymns, we tend to sing those hymns far more often than we hear Charles Wesley's sermons. We have heard the first of the Charles Wesley's hymns today. It's not the first uh, hymn that he wrote. It is the first hymn he wants us to sing, though. The beginning of every Methodist hymnal has one particular hymn, O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing, My Great Redeemer's Praise. So for that is the goal of the entire hymnal, as Charles Wesley put it, this, this, this purpose that we have in, in singing. We sing our great Redeemer's praise. It's what he wants us to start with. We're going to start with John Wesley's first sermon as well today. It's not the first sermon he preached. It's not the first sermon he delivered. But it's the first sermon he wants us to hear. And we know that because he put together a collection of sermons, the, the standard sermons. And, and here are the sermons for you to use, to preach, to be formed by, if you want to preach. If you wanted to preach in the Methodist preaching houses, here are the sermons that Wesley would hand to you. And, and start with these. Let these form you and guide you. And today we're looking at the first of them, salvation by faith. It begins, it's the beginning sermon, it's the first sermon, for it lays out at the core what it means to be a Christian, this understanding of faith. And so I'm going to be sharing this sermon with you, a reworking of it, actually a rather massive reworking of it, because if I preached it for you straight, as Wesley had laid it out, we would be here for quite a while. And uh, also we, there's been some changes in biblical scholarship. We know now than we used to know, and so I, I've added what we now know, and, and Wesley would appreciate that. The, or his method, the, the methods of Methodism, is to always be improving, always be getting better. So this sermon is a, a take on Wesley's first sermon, hopefully more fitting to this time, this place. What type of faith do you have? What type of faith do you have? There are different types of faith. Right? There's one type of faith, right? that is the faith of the heathen. Wesley's term there is just great, heathen. We would probably say more of a generic faith today. Do you have a generic faith? The faith that's a generic faith says that, yes, there is some sort of God. We should do right, right, with justice and, and, and tell the truth and mercy. There will probably be a judgment, but it doesn't say anything more. That was, that's what we would call a generic faith. It's pretty common today. It does not save. Right? There's another step, another degree of faith one might have. Right? The faith that Wesley points out is being held by Satan, which is kind of a shocking idea. What is the faith of Satan? Well, if you look at how Satan acts in the New Testament, Satan shows up to tempt Jesus and uses the scripture to do so. And so we see that what Satan believes is that Jesus is important, which is good, and that the Bible is important, which is also good. But it's not salvific, obviously. Right? Moving on from the generic faith of there is a God to the, through the specific faith that Satan has, that Jesus is, is that God, uh, we now come to the faith of the, the disciples. Do you have the faith of the disciples? The faith the disciples had were, was a faith in Christ sufficient that they were willing to follow Jesus with very little prompting. I'm, I was reading Matthew, or the Gospel of Matthew recently, and I was struck yet again by the way in which uh, when Jesus asked the disciples, hey, let's go, they drop everything and they take off. It's amazing to me how that happens. Right? They just get up and they go. It's impressive that they follow Jesus. Yet if we pay attention to what Jesus says about faith in those days, Jesus talks about the, uh, the faithless generation. Jesus talks about a faithless generation. He does not say a faithless generation except for you 12. He says a faithless generation. Right? So that must include them to some degree. Furthermore, when the disciples ask, Lord, increase our faith, his response is, if you had the faith of a mustard seed. He doesn't say, since you have the faith. He says, if you had the faith. And think what that implies. If you had this, you could do this. But since you don't have the faith of the mustard seed, and mustard seed's about as small of a thing as you can have. Right? So the faith in Christ that the disciples show, that is not sufficient either. It's not what Jesus is looking for. What is the faith that is sufficient? 
The faith that is su sufficient for salvation is the faith of Jesus Christ. Which may not be the word, the framing you're used to hearing. The, the phrase we're used to hearing is faith in Jesus Christ. But this is the faith of Jesus Christ. And, and there's a very big difference. Right? If we follow along, it's in Romans 3, what Paul is laying out this argument. He says, by the works of the law, by the works of trying your hardest, by doing everything you can, no one is going to be saved, no one is going to be justified, through, through the, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Because you know what's wrong, then you do something wrong, and you know that you've done something wrong. Right? That's Paul sort of laying out this next step. Now, apart from the law, apart from trying everything, apart from doing it all yourself, there's another way. The righteousness of God has been manifested. It's pointed to by the prophets, and now the, man, the righteousness of God, the right way to do this, has been shown by the faith of Jesus Christ. The faith of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is getting at. This is one of those things where in your Bible, it's in uh, Romans 3 and then later in Galatians um, when you ever you come across the term faith in Jesus Christ, you probably should just cross out that in and put of. And it's a world of difference, isn't it? The faith in Christ is what the disciples had. The faith in Christ is something I do. It's something that I, it's one of my works. It's something I'm told to do. Have faith in Christ. Okay, I'll let me have faith in Christ. But the faith of Christ is something that Jesus does. And Jesus gets it right. right? Jesus gets it right. It's fitting that an old, I'm preaching an old sermon, and it's actually a very old translation that gets this right. It's the King James that gets this right. When King Jimmy translated it, it's the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all of them. Right? This, this faith of Jesus becomes the gift that allows us to, to be saved. Jesus gets it right when we whiff. This is what we hear. It's in Galatians 2. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of law, but through the faith of Jesus Christ. I can't work my way to salvation, but the faith of Jesus Christ can save. This is the, what Paul is talking about in Ephesians when he's talking about how it's by grace we have been saved through faith. And what is the grace? What is the gift? The gift is the faith of Jesus Christ. It's the faith of Jesus that allows him to say from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. It's the faith of Jesus that allows him to, to face death unafraid. It's the faith of Jesus that is fulfilled when he is resurrected. It's the faith of Jesus that saves. My faith is, well... My faith is insufficient. Right? This is the faith that makes things right, the faith of Jesus. It's not the generic faith that saves. It's not even the faith of, of Satan, the specific faith, or the faith of the disciples. That's not the faith that saves people's lives. What saves is the faith of Jesus. And I find this comforting, for if I had to lean on my faith, I'd be terrified, because my faith is insufficient. My faith is full of doubt. My faith is full of questions and ponderings and wonderings and things I don't understand and moments when it is simply not up to the task. All right? And I've got to admit that there's a fear in me. Like what happens down the road if I end up with dementia or Alzheimer's? If my faith starts to be clouded by my brain not working as well as it ought, does that mean I'm that much less saved? Right? If something happens to me and I cannot think clearly, is now my faith insufficient? Well, good news is it's never my faith that was going to save in the first place. It's the faith of Jesus that saves. It's not the faith in Jesus. It's the faith of Jesus. He got it right. Thanks be to God. And that is what is offered to us. We are offered that, that faith that is a, as a grace, which is another word for gift. We are offered this, great, this faith of Jesus, and we are welcome to be wrapped up in it, to become part of the church, to become along for the ride. We are offered a spot next to Jesus, that walking with him, we can face the future unafraid, face death without fear. We can walk with Jesus, leaning on the faith of Jesus for salvation. The second half of Wesley's great sermon is to make sure we understand that this faith it saves today. Right? The faith of Jesus is not something that will save down the road. It's not something that's for down the, hop, down the road a bit. It's something that saves today. Paul doesn't say, you will be saved. Paul says, you are saved. Present tense, today. We are saved not only from the power of death to come, but, but also from the guilt and the power of sin today. For by grace 
this gift. As we follow Jesus, we are following something far more powerful and beautiful and just enrapturous, something that is far more potent than any sin that we might be wrapped up in. We have a better way to walk, a more satisfying way, and we can do so leaving behind guilt or shame. Echoing with Paul that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ, neither death, life, angels, rulers, nor, nor things present or things to come, powers, height, depth, anything else in all creation. Nothing, none of this can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, this gift that we are given, the grace of Jesus. We are, we are to hold to this promise of what is to come, knowing that it makes a difference today. Now, you might object, as people objected 300 years ago to Wesley, that uh, this might mean that Christians stop doing good works, and, you know, some people can misunderstand and understand that because it's the faith of Jesus that saves, well, maybe I just don't have to do anything anymore. You know, that, that's the same, that'd be like the, like the fellow who gets married and he'd been buying his fiancée flowers all along, and then he gets married and he stops buying her flowers ever again. I mean, you can do it. But it's stupid, right? Just because it's the faith of Jesus that saves doesn't mean I don't continue to, to walk in his footsteps and offer what I can, even if it's not what's going to save me in the end. Right? Th this might encourage people to sin. What, you might object because it, they realize it's not what they do that saves, and, and well, maybe people will must misunderstand. You might object that... Uh, it might cause people to despair, since they re someone might realize that it's not their works that will ever save them. Sometimes despair is the step that we have to go through to get to the truth. We have to despair of, of doing what's broken to be able to find what's, what's not. Right? There are many objections to this, but the long and short of it is it's the faith of Jesus that saves. And, and to say this again, to say it clearly, still matters even 300 years after Wesley first wrote these words. For he, he writes, uh, direct quote, There is no other way to engage the great immorality that has overtaken the land. That sounds like something you could say today, doesn't it? Right? There is no other way to engage the great immorality that has overtaken the land. It would make as much sense to try to handle sin one at a time as it would to empty the sea one drop at a time. That's how Wesley puts it. If you try to change people's lives one sin at a time, one problem at a time, it's as futile as trying to empty the sea one drop at a time. And because I have Google and a calculator, I can tell you how long that would take, actually. There are 1.3 billion cubic kilometers of water in the ocean, and assuming a 5 milliliter eyedropper, emptying it three times a minute, 10 hours a day, six days a week, it would still take you four with 17 zeros after it. That's how many years it would take to empty the sea, right? It's just, it's just a stupid number. How big is four followed by 17 zeros? I, I don't really even understand how big that is. That's how futile it is to try to empty the sea. That's how futile it is to try to change a person's life doing one thing at a time. You've got to get to the root of the problem as Wesley points out. You've got to get to the root of the problem, which is lean not upon our own faith. It's not my faith in Christ that saves. It's the faith of Jesus that saves. And the sooner we confess that, that we're leaning on the one who is complete and whole, we're trusting him for our salvation, the sooner we'll start to get our lives in order. It's not something I'm going to do that's going to save me. It's something that Jesus has already done. Now thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom with the Father and the Holy Spirit be blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might forever and ever. Amen.